We can continue our discussion of direct and indirect band gap semiconductors by focusing on two materials, silicon and gallium arsenide. We have the band structures shown here, which are three-dimensional plots taken down to two dimensions. The vertical axis is the energy, and the band edges of each band are shown. The horizontal axis is K space, crystal momentum space. Each point on this axis is a different direction of momentum. As you move along, it's in fact a different value of the momentum vector. The gamma point is the high symmetry point. It's the dead center of the reciprocal lattice first Brillouin zone. The valence bands have their extrema right at the gamma point. And the conduction band edge may or may not have its extrema at the gamma point. For gallium arsenide on the right, it has its minimum at the gamma point. For silicon on the left, it has its minimum closer to the X point at the edge of the brilliant zone. That's the difference between a direct and an indirect band gap. Silicon is indirect, gallium arsenide is direct. Let's talk about gallium arsenide first. So in gallium arsenide, the conduction band edge has its minimum at the same place in K-space as the valence band has, edge has its maximum, and that's all we really care about because electrons need to jump from the valence band into the conduction band or vice versa, and they have to jump from the minimum of the conduction band to the maximum of the valence band. In the case of a direct gap, those are at the same direction in K-space. But what about silicon? It isn't only the workhorse of semiconducting electronics. Silicon is also an indirect semiconductor. The conduction band minimum is close to the X point in the reciprocal lattice, meaning if an electron is going to transition from the conduction to the valence band, it has to not only undergo an energy change in order to get from one band to the other, it needs a momentum change. It needs impulse. So we need to talk about some ways of giving that impulse. It's not going to come from a photon. Photons carry very little momentum, nothing compared to the crystal momentum that an electron needs to acquire in order to move way over here in K-space. So that's a very large momentum transfer. Remember, momentum is h-bar times k, so the impulse literally is h-bar times delta k, something that we'll be able to readily calculate. With gallium arsenide, no impulse is needed because it's a direct band gap semiconductor. The electron does not need to change its momentum in order to transfer from the valence band to the conduction band. That makes gallium arsenide more suitable for optoelectronics, and in fact, in most optoelectronics, thin film gallium arsenide and other direct band gap materials are what are used. For photovoltaics, silicon remains the workhorse because you can always make silicon work for absorbing light and sending electrons in the conduction band, provided the silicon is thick enough. So let's talk about direct gap materials first. Here's a short list, cadmium, telluride, indium, phosphide, gallium, arsenide. Basically, most 3, 5, and 2, 6 compounds have direct gaps. Not all, but most have direct gaps. Something I would say about direct gap excitation is that it's a two-particle interaction. There are always two particles at play. That is the electron and the photon. So the photon comes and strikes an electron in the valence band, and it goes into the conduction band. Energy was conserved, and momentum was conserved in that collision between the electron and the photon. There are other two-particle formats we could have. We could have an interaction of the electron with something thermal, like a lattice phonon. But at room temperature, you're not likely to have enough thermal excitation to see very many electrons jump into the conduction band which is why light has such a profound impact on the semiconductor. Materials include silicon, germanium, gallium phosphide, several others. I've attempted to qualitatively reproduce the band diagram for silicon. Valence band edge is shown at a peak. This is apparently the gamma point, And the conduction band edge has its minimum over here at the X point in K-space. Question is, how does an electron get from the valence band into the conduction band now? Now it's a three-particle interaction because the electron has to gain energy, which it can do from a photon hitting it, but it doesn't go into the conduction band that way. 
In order to get to one of these available states over here, it has to have a big transfer of momentum. It has to have impulse. And that impulse can't come from the photon. It just doesn't have enough to give it. So in order to conserve crystal momentum, the electron interacts with a phonon. And a phonon is able to transfer momentum to the electron to get it to reorient its momentum in k-space over to the, the x point. So it has to transfer an amount of momentum that equals pi over a times h bar, which is where the x point is located. It's tricky to say that phonons actually carry momentum, but it's a lot less tricky to say that phonons are able to deliver impulse. So we just, we just accept that, that the phonon can deliver this impulse to the electron and allow it to go over here. The photon gives it a bunch of energy. Perhaps the phonon gives it a little bit of energy. And then the, but the photon can only give it a little bit of momentum. That's not enough. So most of the impulse comes from the phonon. So here's a little heuristic argument that you might rely on to kind of give you an understanding of how a phonon transfers momentum to an electron. Here's an atom in the crystal, and it's vibrating because it has thermal energy, and it vibrates back and forth, and the amplitude of the vibration is the lattice constant, plus or minus a. Along comes an electron, and the electron collides with that vibration, and it gets a momentum kick. Well, how much momentum kick? Well, momentum is h bar times k. So it can get a delta momentum of h bar times delta k. The k is 2 pi over the vibration amplitude. So we can say that k is 2 pi divided by a. And so the momentum kick is h bar times 2 pi over a, or the delta k that the electron will experience is 2 pi divided by the lattice constant. What the electron's actually doing is receiving crystal momentum from the phonon. I also like to point out this pinball machine analogy breaks down very easily. When a pinball hits a bumper, it receives an impulse because of a spring-loaded mechanism inside the bumper. It's like that. The electron hitting the atom, and think of the atom as the bumper in a pinball machine. The atom is spring-loaded. That spring-loading is the phonon, and it delivers a bunch of impulse then to the electron. Now, how much momentum change does the electron actually require to go from the valence band into the conduction band? And the simpler question is, how much wave number change, k, is required? Because remember, k times h bar is momentum. Change in wave number has to go from k of 0 to k of pi over a. So pi over a is the change in wave number. We can calculate a number by using the lattice constant of silicon, 0.54 nanometers, and we get 6 times 10 to the 9th per meter is the required delta K. The photon itself might be, say, a 600 nanometer photon, in which case it's able to give a delta K of 2 pi over 600 nanometers is 600 times 10 to the minus 9th meters. K is 10 to the 7th per meter, which is less than 1% of what's needed. So we have to rely on something else, and that would be the phonon. And the question is, is the phonon able to give enough momentum to move the electron? Almost by definition, yes, because the delta K for a phonon is 2 pi over the lattice constant. So it's going to transfer twice as much as what's needed at least. So it will be able to deliver enough impulse to move the electron over to the edge of the Brillouin zone. So that's how indirect band gaps do their business, how they can take an electron in the valence band and move it up into the conduction band, despite the fact that the conduction band has its minimum at a significantly different place in momentum space. They rely on lattice vibrations to deliver the impulse to redirect those electrons. Basically, the electron's momentum needs to change direction in order to get up to this point in the conduction band. Okay, the next time we're going to shift gears a little bit now and start talking about the mass of the charged carriers. The electrons moving around in K-space appear to have a different mass than the mass of a free electron. And we're going to account for that and show how we adjust our calculations to make sense of that.